As the president of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, it's my pleasure and privilege to announce the winner of the Abel Prize 2016. Styret i den norske vitenskapsakademi har besluttet å tildele Abelprisen for 2016 til Sir Andrew Wiles for hans bevis av Fermas siste sats via modularitetsformodningen for semistabile elliptiske kurver som innledet en ny æra i tallteorien. The Board of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters has decided to award the Abel Prize for 2016 to Sir Andrew Wiles for his stunning proof of Fermat's last theorem by way of the modularity conjecture for semi-stable elliptic curves, opening a new era in number theory. Good afternoon. The Abel Committee this year has consisted of Professors Luigi Ambrosio, Raul van der Ripande, Marta Sansole, and Eva Tardos. My name is Jon Rognes, and I am the current chair of the Abel Committee. Our citation reads as follows. Number theory, an old and beautiful branch of mathematics, is concerned with the study of arithmetic properties of the integers. In its modern form, the subject is fundamentally connected to complex analysis, algebraic geometry, and representation theory. Number theoretic results play an important role in our everyday lives through encryption algorithms for communications, financial transactions, and digital security. Fermat's last theorem first formulated by Pierre de Fermat in the 17th century, is the assertion that the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no solutions in positive integers for n greater than 2. Fermat proved his claim for n equals 4. Leonard Euler found a proof for n equals 3. And Sophie Germain proved the first general result that applies to infinitely many prime exponents. And Kummer's study of the problem unveiled several basic notions in algebraic number theory, such as ideal numbers and the subtleties of unique factorization. The complete proof found by Andrew Wiles relies on three further concepts in number theory, namely elliptic curves, modular forms, and Galois representations. Elliptic curves are defined by cubic equations in two variables. They are the natural domains of definition of the elliptic functions introduced by Niels Henrik Abel. Modular forms are highly symmetric analytic functions defined on the upper half of the complex plane and naturally factor through shapes known as modular curves. An elliptic curve is said to be modular if it can be parametrized by a map from one of these modular curves. The modularity conjecture proposed by Goro Shimura, Yutaka Taniyama, and Andre Weil in the 1950s and 60s claims that every elliptic curve defined over the rational numbers is modular. In 1984, Gerhard Frey associated a semi-stable elliptic curve to any hypothetical counterexample to Fermat's last theorem and strongly suspected that this elliptic curve would not be modular. Frey's non-modularity was proven via Jean-Pierre Serre's epsilon conjecture by Ken Ribbet in 1986. Hence, a proof of the Shimura, Taniyama, Weil modularity conjecture for semi-stable elliptic curves would also yield a proof of Fermat's last theorem. However, at the time, the modularity conjecture was widely believed to be completely inaccessible. It was therefore a stunning advance when Andrew Wiles, in a breakthrough paper published in 1995, introduced his modularity lifting technique and proved the semi-stable case of the modularity conjecture. 
The modularity lifting technique of Wiles concerns the Galois symmetries of the points of finite order in the abelian group structure on an elliptic curve. Building upon Barry Mazur's deformation theory for such Galois representations, Wiles identified a numerical criterion which ensures that modularity for points of order P can be lifted to modularity for points of order any power of P, where P is an odd prime. This lifted modularity is then sufficient to prove that the elliptic curve is modular. The numerical criterion was confirmed in the semi-stable case by using an important companion paper written jointly with Richard Taylor. Theorems of Robert Langlands and Gerald Tunnell show that in many cases, the Galois representation given by the points of order three is modular. By an ingenious switch from one prime to another, Wiles showed that in the remaining cases, the Galois representation given by the points of order five is modular. This completed his proof of the modularity conjecture and thus also of Fermat's last theorem. The new ideas introduced by Wiles were crucial to many subsequent developments, including the proof in 2001 of the general case of the modularity conjecture by Christoph Breu, Brian Conrad, Fred Diamond, and Richard Taylor. As recently as 2015, Nuno Freitas, Bao Le Hong, and Shamir Siksek proved the analogous modularity statement over real quadratic number fields. Few results have as rich a mathematical history and as dramatic a proof as Fermat's last theorem. And I now have the great pleasure of introducing Alex Bellos, writer and broadcaster, author and columnist, who will give us his perspective on the work of this year's Abel Laureate. Thank you very much. So I am going to spend the next 15 minutes giving a simplified account of the mathematics for which Andrew Wiles has just won this year's Arbel Prize. So let's go straight to the citation. The citation says, let's read it out, for his stunning proof of Fermat's last theorem by way of the modularity conjecture for semi-stable elliptic curves opening a new era in number theory. Now there are two elements in this statement that I want to highlight. Fermat's last theorem, and the modularity conjecture, I will explain what both of these things are, how they relate to each other, and the work and the role of Andrew Wiles. So, where do we start? Let's start at the beginning. Let's start with Pythagoras' theorem. This is the most famous theorem in mathematics. It is, rhetorically, for right-angled triangles, the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. So if the hypotenuse is Z or Z, the other two sides are X and Y, it says that X squared plus Y squared is equal to Z squared. Now, if there are whole numbers such that, whole numbers X, Y, and Z, such that that equation is satisfied, we call these numbers Pythagorean triples. They're the whole number solutions for X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared. For example, most simply, 3, 4, and 5, because 3 squared, which is 9, added to 4 squared, which is 16, equals 25, which is 5 squared. It also works with 5, 12, and 13, and this big number here. In fact, there are an infinite number of Pythagorean triples, and it's something that people, mathematicians especially, are very interested in. Now, Pierre de, Fa Pierre de Fermat, very famous French 17th century mathematician. In fact, he wasn't really a mathematician. His day job, he was a judge. He was a judge in Toulouse in the south of France. And when he came home at night, he wasn't supposed to go around mixing with, with people who he might be sentencing. So he did lots of mathematics. In fact, he corresponded with the greatest mathematicians of his day and came up with lots of amazing maths himself. He's known, nicknamed the Prince of Amateurs. So he was looking at Pythagorean, th Pythagorean triples and then wondered, what happens if I you know, turn the knob up? Rather than x squared plus y squared equals z squared, what about x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed? Are there any whole number solutions? Couldn't find any. What about x to the 4 plus y to the 4 equals z to the 4? 
Likewise, x5 plus y to the 5, you could keep on going. And then we come to his statement of the theorem. He wrote this statement, which we now know is Fermat's last theorem, which is that the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no whole number solutions when n is bigger than 2. Now, he didn't do like what a mathematician would do these days, which is write the theorem and then prove it. He actually was reading this book here, The Arithmetica by Diophantus, a very famous Greek mathematician. And on a section about Pythagorean triples, he wrote this statement. And then the sentence, I have a truly marvelous demonstration of this proposition, which this margin is too narrow to contain. Possibly the most famous line in all of, the most famous non-mathematical line in all of mathematics. And the reason why we call it the last theorem, it wasn't the last thing he did, it was the last thing to be resolved because, you know, a famous mathematician says he has a truly marvellous demonstration. Other mathematicians are going to want to try and find it. But no one can find it after 100 years, after 200 years, after 300 years. The middle of the 20th century, it was the most famous unsolved problem in mathematics. In fact, it was the subject of books and in 1963, when Andrew Wiles was 10 years old, he went and uh, got one of these books out of the library. It's called The Last Problem. And he discovered about this, and he said, I knew from that moment on, I would never let it go. That's Fermat's last theorem. I had to solve it. So as well as an incredible mathematical journey, the story of Andrew Wiles' proof of Fermat's last theorem is a wonderfully inspiring personal journey also. Now, the proof that he found was not something that you could, well, the Fermat, definitely you could put it in a margin, but, but Fermat, there's no way he could have known. And it's now assumed that Fermat was mistaken by saying that he had a truly marvellous demonstration, because the mathematics required to solve it was well, only developed, discovered, way after Fermat died. And the two areas of mass that were used, one, elliptic curves. We heard that in the citation, elliptic curves, and the other, modular forms. So I'm going to explain a little bit about these two types of mathematics. So an elliptic curve, well, it comes from an ellipse. What's an ellipse? An ellipse, you can't see it very well there, but the, the paths of the planets, planets orbit in ellipses. And at the late 18th century, mathematicians trying to work out the distance along ellipses came up with another type of curve, another, which is an equation. So it's not an ellipse, it's an elliptic curve, and it's of the form, it's a cubic equation, y squared equals x to the cube plus a to the x plus b, where a and b are constants. And what do they look like? Well, you can map these, you can, well, you can draw these on the xy axis, and that's what they look like. But if you want to analyze them using complex numbers, which is a little bit more complex, complicated area of mathematics. You can see them in kind of 3D, and the solutions there look a bit like this, which this is a kind of donut that we've sliced. And I don't know if you recognize that slice in a figure of eight, because that is exactly the figure of eight that Arbel was drawing in his famous Lemnus gate, which is on Norwegian 20 kroner coins. Okay, that's elliptic curves, this kind of interesting curve that come from ellipses. A modular form, a totally different type of mathematics. A modular form is a type of mapping that has an extremely high number of symmetries. What's a mapping? A mapping is just something that you take a point from one place and you put it somewhere else. It maps something from here to here. Let's think about two different types of mappings now. Imagine you've got this plane here in two different colors, and the mapping is going to be take any point and then move it one horizontally to the right. So just say a point was here, it would map to there. Or if a point was here, it would map to there. This is one type of mapping, the plus one mapping. This is a different type of mapping that takes any point inside the blue hemisphere, or well, hemisphere, it's a semicircle, <laughs> the blue semicircle, and maps it to a unique point outside it. So it would take something from here to a unique point outside it. Likewise, any point in the red would be mapped into the semicircle. Mix these two together, combine them, and you get this image here. And the symmetries that you see in this image 
are exactly the same symmetries that you get in certain types of modular forms. Okay, so elliptic curves, modular forms, totally different, different areas of mathematics, thought up by different mathematicians using different terminology to solve different problems at different times. Now, in the 1950s, two Japanese mathematicians, Yutaka Taniyama and Goro Shimura, for the first time thought, do you know what, maybe these two areas, these two kind of separate islands in mathematics are actually joined, or that are actually kind of the same thing in, in, in certain senses. They thought that every elliptic curve could be associated with its own modular form. Okay, what's this got to do with Fermat's last theorem? Nothing yet. Let's look back at Fermat's last theorem. The equation x to the n plus y to the n equals n to the n has no whole number solutions for n is bigger than 2. Now, everyone was trying to prove it because Fermat said it was true. It was his conjecture. But just say it was false. There's also the chance that it was false. So let's say, let's say it's false. So if it's false, then there is a solution to that equation for n is bigger than 2. Let's imagine the solution. Let's call it this. So there's big A to the big N plus B to the N plus C to the N for some A, B, C, and N bigger than 2. Well, in the uh, mid-80s, Gerhard Frey, a German mathematician, took that and managed to create this equation here. And does that look familiar? That's an elliptic curve. But something is weird about this elliptic curve. It looks like it has no modular form, something that was confirmed by Ken Ribbit a couple of years later. But hang on. Look what we've got. If Fermat's last theorem is false, there's a solution to that. Then we get an elliptic curve that has no modular form. But that means the Taniyama Shimura conjecture must be false, because the Taniyama Shimura conjecture says that every elliptic curve does have a modular form. And there's a bit of basic logic here. We've got if A is false, means that B is false. So if Fermat's last theorem is false, means that the Taniyama Shimura conjecture is false. You can do the contrapositive argument, which would be that if the Taniyama conjecture is true, then Fermat's last theorem is also true. So this work in the 1980s translated or replaced the problem or rewrote the problem of solving Fermat's last theorem to the problem of solving or of proving the Taniyama Shimura conjecture. Remember, that's the conjecture that shows that every elliptic curve has a modular form. And this is something that, just because it was associated, didn't make it any easier. Possibly the fact that it was related to Fermat meant that it was also, we didn't have the mathematical tools to be able to solve it. But Andrew Wiles solved it. How did he do it? This is a very simplified account of how he solved it. Because it turns out that every elliptic curve, you can produce a series of numbers from it, kind of like it's DNA, long sort of string of numbers. You get that, if you understand uh, for the more advanced people in the audience, from its solutions in modular, arith modular arithmetic. On the side of the modular forms, you can also get a kind of DNA produced there, which are the coefficients of its Fourier expansion. And what Andrew Wiles did, inventing a whole new way of, a whole new toolkit, as we call it, was to show that you could match the DNA of one to the DNA of the other. They were basically identical. So once he had solved it, it's no longer a conjecture. It's called a theorem, and it's called the modularity theorem. And there's another amazing thing about this Andrew Wells' solution, which is not just the mathematics. It's how he did it. Because normally when you do maths, it's collaborative. You talk to people. Andrew Wiles spent seven years solving the problem on his own. He didn't tell anyone else apart from his wife. And in 1993, when he had the solution, he then announced it to cheers here, the picture at a lecture at a conference in Cambridge. It made him one of the most famous mathematician um, of the age, really. And he was on the front cover of the New York Times, and pretty much all the major newspapers of the world. But then there was a problem. A few months later, a gap, a little flaw in the proof was discovered. So he went back and a year later, with the help of a student, Richard Taylor, managed to fix it. And then in 1995, the final proof was published. And just to show that the amazing kind of personal journey that he went on, because not only is it incredible to solve, to attack a problem like this and get that far, but to find a mistake and then go back 
and have the focus and the stamina to actually solve it, um, to, to fix the mistake, is almost unheard of in mathematics. So let's just finish again with summing up um, the citation, because yes, what he did was prove Fermat's last theorem, but really he proved something which is much more important, much, much deeper, which is the modularity conjecture or modularity theorem, because it linked these two, or confirmed that there was this connection between these two, until then thought, this different part of mathematics. And through the toolkit that he invented, it has opened up whole new areas of number theory and mathematics itself. Thank you very much. We, we are hopefully able to speak to Sir Andrew Wiles in Oxford, actually in the Andrew Wiles building. And um, in fact, when I was chatting to Sir Andrew not long ago, he said that sometimes he actually gets letters to um, Sir Andrew Wiles building. But Wiles building is not his surname. Uh, Sir Andrew, I, I, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Well, firstly, um, congratulations from everyone here. And I wonder if we can start off, if you can just um, tell me, you know, what were your thoughts when you picked up the phone this morning and you heard someone with a Norwegian accent at the end of it? I was totally bemused. I was expecting a call from someone else and had the wrong accent in my <laughs> <laughs> so what accent were you expecting? I was expecting uh, something from the south of England. <laughs> but uh, then it was a Norwegian accent and I thought, oh, he wants to comment on something. And then I realized it was for me. And then uh, it was very, very exciting. And you, you've won uh, prizes before and had, um, you know, you know other awards, but what does it feel like to have won the Arbel Prize, which is famous and distinguished? Oh, it's a tremendous feeling to get the Arbel Prize. Uh, of course, the Arbel Prize didn't exist when I worked on this problem, and it's since become such a distinguished prize. Uh, and so many people who deserve to get it, I feel very honored that I've been selected. And if we look back at those sort of seven years that you were solving on your own, um, when you look back at them, do you think, wow, how did I manage that? Or um, what was I thinking? What was your, what, how, how do you see that time of your life now? Uh, well, it shrinks. You re I remember happily the great moments of, of breakthrough, the eureka moments. That's what stays with you and the months of uh, unsuccessful attempt fade away. So, yes, the memories are very happy of that period. Um, and when I look back at the actual written, I'm amazed at what I myself did. I've forgotten the details. I look back and I see a, a great feeling to feel I, I got there. You, you, you're talking then about, about remembering the amazing breakthroughs, but did you ever go through the lows also thinking, like losing faith, that you were ever going to do it? Uh, I was totally focused on doing it, so I, I, I just couldn't face the idea of not, not getting there. That's a very good moral lesson for everyone, I think. Um, when you were working on it, obviously, Fermat's last theorem is the famous um, sort of conclusion to it. But were you also realizing and thinking, I'm opening a whole other area of, of, of maths? Or did you really just have your eye on the prize on Fermat? Or were you also thinking on other, other types of mathematics and, and where that could eventually lead to? I was focused on Fermat, but what had made this breakthrough of, of Fry and Ribbit was that I could work on it responsibly, that is, I could work on, a, on problems that I knew had to be solved and were very, very important for the rest of mathematics. 
they would have been much less satisfying to find the proof that only resolved Fermat's last theorem and did nothing to the rest of mathematics. So it was very, very serendipitous, really, that the parts of mathematics that you were expert in turned out to be exactly those parts that were required for a proof. Uh, yes, that was my, either my great good fortune or my great intuitive judgment when I went into these fields, yes. Let's, let's call it intuitive judgment. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on the direction that number theory in particular has gone on in light of your proof of the modularity theorem? Well, I think it's, it's very exciting that it's, it's expanded and expanded. I, I thought it would be helpful, but I had no idea how big a uh, field it could develop into. Uh, it's very exciting to have watched it. And what, what do you think the future is for uh, number theory in this area? Are there any new signature problems that need solving and that are explainable to a lay audience? <laughs> well, there's a whole program which is trying to understand these uh, modular forms as you describe, these objects that really come from and from geometry, in terms of arithmetic, in terms of solutions of equations with numbers. Uh, it's a very surprising connection, and I think it, it shows something very, very deep in mathematics, and the more we study it, the more surprised and, uh, and the more beautiful it seems. Well, I think that's really exciting to, to, to realize that mathematics isn't something that you just you get the answer and that's it, that, that every new um, discovery leads on to more depth and more discoveries. Um, the final question, the, you know, the Arbel Prize comes with quite a large cash sum, about half a million dollars, I think. I was just wondering if anything comes to mind that you might want to spend it on. Is, are we going to see a new, a new extension or a, a new car or a holiday? Or a, have you a, a given any thought to it quite yet? And no thought yet. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. this morning and I'm just, uh, <laughs> just recovering from the shock. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. And we'll see you in Norway in May. Um, but once again, congratulations, Sir Andrew Wiles, um, winner of the Arbel Prize 2016. I would like to thank uh, the audience for coming here today. This year's uh, Arbel Prize Laureate celebration will continue at the House of Literature in Oslo tonight. Uh, this evening at 6.30, the public is invited into the world of mathematics, where Alex Bellos again will present the work of the Arbel Laureate Sir Andrew Wiles and research journalist Turkil Jemteru from the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, NRK P2, will host the live program Abel's Torn to discuss the work of the Abel Laureate. I also have the pleasure of welcoming you to the Abel Prize Award Ceremony at the University Aula, Tuesday, May 24, at 2 p.m. Sir Andrew Wiles will receive the Abel Prize from His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince. The ceremony will be followed by a reception at the Norske Teatre, where TV host and journalist Nadia Hasnaoui will interview the laureate. You are most welcome to join us in celebrating Sir Andrew Wiles.